Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Meepleville Meets. Today, we have the owner, founder, uh, whatever, of probably, arguably, or not even arguably, of the board game central in the entire universe. Please welcome Scott Aldi Alden to the interview. Hello, Aldi. Hey, Tim. How's it going? I'm Thanks doing for having great. me on. Yeah, and thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited uh, that you're here uh, because, as I said, Board Game Geek really is the everything board games. Uh, and well, it, I appreciate so, that. Yeah, no, and congratulations for getting into that point. But so what I want to do is, first of all, um, because a lot of times we have a crossover with audiences, you know, some people who are, you know, board gamers know who you are, all this kind of stuff, but there's a lot of people just getting into the hobby. So if you could give me sort of an elevator pitch, USP, exactly how you define board game geek or what you would say it is huh okay so our mission statement is to be the definitive resource for board game information but that being said there's so much more to that right it's a social network built into a informational resource so there's the database part which tracks all your board games and keeps track of all your collections but then there's also the community right? Which people talk about games, they review games, they rate games. Um, that's the tip of the iceberg. There's a bunch of content creation type stuff like geek lists and videos, uh, file translations, file, any kind of file, like maybe even player aids. So just wanted this place to be, to come find out information about any game imaginable. And it pretty much is like, as far as we know, I mean, there's still probably tons and tons oh, of yeah. games that aren't <laughs> in there. Right. But the games that kind of like, and I don't want to make this sound like a pejorative thing, but like the games that matter, right? Like there's a ton of historical type games that yes, people just aren't, in, you know, uh, normal people, normal, like beyond the collecting slash history perspective of it, aren't interested in, right? right. It's the games we play, right? True, true. But it's funny because the, what you said is, uh, so we have this big uh, collection that Dave and I are moderating. Dave is my partner with uh, um, Dice Tower West. And along with Tom as well, but uh, we've been um, uh, curating this big collection, and we actually have found a couple of games that aren't on BG. Aren't in there? Yeah, and, for and sure. It kind of surprised me. It's kind of strange. So, okay, so you are a uh, board game central. So, again, um, I'm going to be asking you a lot of questions, a lot of technical terms. So please make sure, like, when you talk and you describe them, try to be as like simple as you are for people like me. Okay. Don't know <laughs> terms and stuff. Okay. So, okay. So, I want to kind of ask you what you do like like and i mean by that is to make bgg run the site so what exactly is your specialty how do you do what do you do to make it run good question i ask myself that a lot these days <laughs> <laughs> because the company has grown right like but let's go back up let's back up to should I go back in history and kind of bring you through like how I evolved my job personally? Is that okay? well, well, yes and wanna... no. I mean, I mean, first of all, it's just I, I mean, I'm sort of wondering like, so your job, like, do you have to constantly like update, moderate, like write code? Like, I don't understand even how you know, how it just right. operates. I used to. Okay. I I'm more of a manager now these days, which is different, right? And I'm not, and it's re really weird because I didn't we didn't start the website to be, I didn't do that because I wanted to be a manager, but the more people that come into the company, the more that kind of requires of like, so we've got a code system and we've got a designer and we've got a moderate, you know, we've got moderator people and we've got marketing people and we've got the store people, you know, so it's sort of a management position, right? right I see. But, okay. that, but so that's more my job these days. I do still, I'm very technical. Like I'm a technical natured person by, I, I'm a computer science uh, engineer. Okay. That was my degree. Mm -hmm. That's what I went to college for. And when I got out of college, I went right into telecommunications. Okay. So, so I started I programming in telecommunications when I got out of school. Okay. So I guess we should probably go back maybe then work up to our point because maybe all those answers or questions will be answered. Yeah, for there. sure. So, yeah. So um, I'm kind of interested in the genesis of Board Game Geek. Like what were the initial iterations? What did you do? And how did it come up to like day one of BGG? Right. So to understand that, I have to talk a little bit about myself, which I don't want to talk about too much, but like uh, I was into um, uh, games all my life, obviously. I think a lot of people who come on this show are, right? If you're not into games, why are you, you know, you wouldn't devote whole, you know, your entire life to it. 
So I was into gaming in college. When I graduated college, I got right into a full-time job in the telecom industry. And then shortly, I got I just got so bored with that. And a friend from college wrote me and said, hey, do you want to get into the video game industry? I said, yes. He said, well, fly out to LA, or uh, LA, no, it, the Bay Area, right? San Francisco. I interviewed and I got a job on the same day. So I, then I, and I immediately moved. I moved within two weeks. So I went to California for a year uh, from Dallas, basically. I went, to, I went to University of Florida, but I moved to Dallas right after that for the uh, telecom job. But then I moved to, to San Francisco for a year. And then I came back and got into the video game industry as a, de as a designer and developer um, and a programmer. So um, as I was getting into video games, I started reading about board games too, right? Like there's this old, well, I shouldn't say old, it still exists, but um, a thing on the internet called uh, Usenet. I don't know if you, have you ever heard of that? You are aware no, of not really, no. Okay. Imagine a, a worldwide board, bulletin board system where people could just post messages and then everybody in the world would see it. So there was a website or there was a board, they call it, uh, called rec.games.board. So under the rec, R-E-C dot, and then a sub dot, and then games dot, and there would be like video game, but board was one of the, one of the, the names, right? And that was where I started reading about all these games that I'm like, wow, what are all these board games? I, I don't know why, but board games just started picking back up again for me. Um, I, I mean, I, I started playing Catan. One of my poker nights fell through. We got Catan. We started playing that all night, got hooked. So I got into the board game thing. I'm like, started reading about board games on Rec Games Board. And then I started searching the web. And web back in the 90s was very, I would say it's non-commercial. It was not commercialized as much, right? You had blogs and you had wiki um, type pages, right? But mostly blogs. So you would read about all these board games for blogs. Uh, very little English information. Lots of German uh, websites, but no Google Translate back then. So I just got interested in board games and I started up a... I was sort of doing some side projects with my job in video games. Um, and one of them was a video game blog website that was user contributed. So as a user of the website, you could come in and post a story about video games. And it, it went well for about a year, but then it stopped. Like just people stopped contributing to it, right? It just kind of stagnated and died. I got real busy with the job. I didn't have time to put into it. Um, so I shut it down. Um, but as I was getting into the board game thing, the video game website kept popping up my mind, like, oh, I wonder if I could just rewrite the, and I wrote all the code for it, right? Um, I wonder if I could convert it into a board game website <laughs> and then just start keeping track of all these board games that we that we were buying, right? We were buying games blind. We had no information. We would just get a catalog. Um, there, was a, there was a retailer in Germany called Adam Spielt back in uh, the 90s, and they spoke English, and you could call them with a credit card, and they would ship you the games, and the giant box of games would show up in your door like every other week. So I was spending a ton of money and like having no information. I eventually got invited to a private mailing list called Diggers, D-I-G-E-R-S, short for Desert Island Gamers, like talking about uh, board games. And there was so much information in this mailing list. I was like, my mind was blown, right? Because it was a, a run on the Yahoo group system. And you could go back and look at all the archives of each post, sort of like used that a little bit, but a little bit all private. So I was like, why is all this information private? Why is it behind this? Now, it wasn't like trying to keep people out, but it kept a certain people, a certain type of person out. Like you couldn't just go look at all that content, right? Uh, and you had to sort of apply to be a part of it. And it was there was a, there was a barrier there, a uh, gatekeeping type thing. So I was like, why is this all secret? You know, or not secret, but like just in a, an unaccessible way. I'm sure a lot of people would have liked to share that information with other people, right? That's the thing about the board game industry. Everybody wants to talk about board games, right? Like, or what they like and what they enjoy. It's a, right, right, so right. having it in this mailing list was weird. Uh, it struck me wrong. So a board game geek got created from the video game geek code, right? And then we started cutting and pasting content from the mailing list into the board game geek database with, with permission. We would ask everybody. Um, and back in the early days, I think Greg Schlosser, he had been writing he'd been writing about games for like 10 years by that point. And he had tons of information about all these games that no one had ever heard of. Right. And so we just started cutting and pasting, putting it in, putting it in. And that's sort of how board game geek started, right? Database okay. of games. Yeah. So, so, so real quick. And again, I'm sorry. I'm asking these questions because people want to maybe like, you know, you don't know that anyway, I'm not quite sure what code is. I mean, I, okay. I, 
these yeah. things about ones and zeros and all this kind of stuff. And I'm, yeah. I don't really want to, you know, have a like a thesis or I don't want to talk about what code is. But I'm just wondering what exactly does that mean to get this started when somebody says I wrote code to develop the program? Yeah. Um, so unbeknownst to many people, the background of the of the basically the whole not the entirety of the internet. There's still there's things called static web pages, which are basically like you type up a web page and you upload it and then there it is. But there are also dynamic web pages, like Board Game Geek is one of those. There's a program running in the background, day and night, never stops. Every time you re request a page, meaning you type in a URL, like boardgamegeek.com slash boardgame1, which is Democker, right? Like if you request that page, there's a program running on a computer. It used to run in a computer under my desk in my bedroom back in 2000, but now it's running in the cloud um, that processes that request generates all the data all the data that is required from a database so there's a database back there that stores data like the name of the game and the year it was published and all the mechanics and designer artist all that stuff puts it all together formats it into a web page that can present to you on your screen through a web browser right so does that clarify but but there's code there okay that runs it's a program, a listing of commands that in run, run in a specific order to do all that stuff. And that's in a nutshell. Yeah. Okay, so good. So that's what that's kind of where my confusion is or my lack of understanding. So no you have to write each step of the way to make sure all those things happen. Is right. that correct? Yeah. And back in the day, there was this there's this program language, and it's still around in Portuguese, you still write on it called PHP. And from what I understand, Facebook runs on that too. And that's the language. You, do you know what a computer language is? If I say that, like C or Pascal or I mean, nothing I, like that. Again, I know I've heard the term. So, <laughs> so it's exactly what you think. It's a foreign language, but it's written in English, right? It's an English foreign language that computers will eventually break down to understand of what to do. Okay. And you write it like you type it and you save it as a file, right? And you've got the code and it goes through and all that stuff. So that's the that's the meat of it. Right. And now every single web page that comes into Board Game Geek, there's some code back there that runs on another computer in the cloud right now. It used to be under my desk when I first started, right? right. And it gets all the data, pulls it from different places, all the images that have been uploaded, it pulls those in, and it presents that to you on your web browser or phone, whatever. And then all the screen stuff pops up and you get to read what okay what, so, what it how it is. So then in the beginning when you were developing this. Was it always your intent to make the site sort of interactive where it was user contributed and people could get stuff from it instead of just being like, you know, like a dictator and just saying, this is what you're going to watch. Did you always want it to be a community based thing? No. Oh, no, because we were cutting and pasting from other people, right? Like they were not doing the, the, I should say it's like work, but like uploading the, their, their content, right? Like, and I don't know if you remember the phrase web 2.0. Do does, does that ring yeah. a bell? Yeah. No. So web 2.0 is the interactive web where the users get to create the content, right? Like that was sort of like the thing. And, and in fact, we invented it. We didn't say we invented it, but we did it before web 2.0 was a thing, right? User-driven, content-driven websites. Okay. So, okay. So that wasn't your intent. Then. It wasn't so the intent. No, but, but we got tired of cutting and pasting. Right. <laughs> so I was like, you know what, why don't we just let people do it themselves? Right. So we have to create a system. This is more code where people type in your username and password and create an account. Right. right. And then we have to attribute all the, all the content you create to your account. That takes more code. Right. So you see how it gets more and more complicated. Right. Of course. Like, so yeah. Yeah, so let's talk about that a little bit then. So in the beginning, you're doing all this cutting and pasting and stuff. This is sort of your hobby because you have a full-time job. Yeah. How did the ball start rolling where all of a sudden you're like, wow, there's more and more people doing this. They're interested. The board game industry is getting bigger. The internet is getting, you know, bigger as far as, you know, accessibility and, you know, technology. So how was that whole ball rolling process? Right. So the website started in January of 2020. And then that was the cutting and pasting stuff. And our our little our local board game group did most of that, right? Like some of my friends. Um, and we launched it, and then everybody's like, oh, this is cool. We can read about all these games, right? But how do you get more data in there? So like I think it was like 2001, and I'm a little misty on the dates, but like 2001 or 2002, 
I was like, you know what? Let's just have the user system create where they could just upload it themselves, right? And then we'll have their account. We can put their name on there. Because we were like cutting and pasting people's names too. And it was weird. It was just an awkward thing. So once that happened, and it took a little time, but it took maybe I would say like two to three years of people like, oh, I can go to boardgamegeek.com and upload my review of, let's say, whatever game came out at that time, right? Raw <laughs> or something like that. Catan. So... Once that started, little by little, and this is not an overnight growth, you know, user thing. I mean, it's like maybe like a thousand users a year at that or in those early days. Um, we're uploading and putting up stuff like pictures and files and right, reviews right, right. and things like that. So okay. each year that went by, um, Board Game Geek was just taking a little more and more of my time. Mm -hmm. Right, I was working in the full, I was working full time in the in the video game industry. I was working on a game called Duke Nukem Forever. Some people may have heard of that. Um, when I, I came to the realization in 2005 that I was like, I'm working on this all the time and I'm having very little, um, what's the word joy, <laughs> uh, fulfillment in my video game job. And I was having more fulfillment in the board game geek job, right. Of adding new features to the website. And by adding new features, that's writing more code, doing all that stuff. Uh, that I was like decided with my, my wife, Michelle, mm -hmm. that I was going to quit and go full time. Now this oh. was a risk because I was doing pretty well in the video game world, right? right 3D I, Realms is a pretty, was a pretty successful uh, video game company and they paid well. Right. But, but up until this point, so when you made that decision, um, I just want to kind of sort of backtrack and make sure yeah. I get it fixed here. Were, was any of BGG being monetized at all? Not until 2004. Okay, so, so it was all out of my pocket, basically. Okay, so you had a year of monetization per se before you made that decision. So how did like the initial part start as far as monetization? How did you start monetizing and what was the response and how did people come in in 2004? So 2004 was purely user-based support, right? So people could just send us a, a $20 check or a PayPal I think it was PayPal back then. I can't remember. <laughs> like an online payment system. <laughs> I think it was called X.com back in the day. Um, and if you sent us money, we would put a little badge under your avatar, right? Like your persona and say, you supported us in 2004. And so we created a little badge for that. And that was, I would say like a couple hundred people did that. Um, certainly not enough to pay a salary, but it was a little something, right? Like it was like enough to pay some bills and pay some... We and we were growing at that point in 2004. Like the the fees to pay and keep it running were getting up there. What like, I would say it was like under a thousand dollars a month, but still like twelve thousand dollars a year is like kind of a lot for a hobby. Like just no, absolutely. you know, website like you know, like paying paying bills and stuff. Uh -huh. um, 2005 is when I quit my job. Right, so at the end of 05, I quit. Um, we had started uh, advertising. Right. So banner ads were like the thing and they still are. Uh, AdSense had come out, Google AdSense, which basically meant you could put Google ads on your website and get paid for it. Um, and then we also sold ads directly. I remember one of our first advertisers was Eagle Games. Um, so that was like our first ever advertiser. Oh, OK. Very good. So yeah. I'm just wondering then. So you made a decision. You said you talked to your wife. Do you have a family, by the way? Do you have kids? I don't have kids. You don't just have kids. Me and Michelle. Yeah. OK. You and, you and Michelle. Yep. But I don't know, uh, and again, I don't need to know exact numbers or anything, but I don't know whether she was working, what your you know financial situation was like. I just want to know, like, that that's a pretty big decision, right? You're leaving a well-paying job in the video game industry to, to do this startup. You're not quite sure what the future can hold. But I just want to try to maybe get into your head a little bit at that point. And what were you, like, you know, the good angel, the bad devil, or whatever it is, like, how are you weighing yeah, you know what? This is the right decision for me to do. What, what were some of your thoughts? Well, biggest thing was just enjoyment of working, right? Like I really, I, I love the video game industry, and it, but it's a tough, it's a tough business, a tough job. Like you work a lot. Um, you work weekends, you get, you work crunch time, you work long hours, you know, you work nights. Uh, and I, not saying that that hasn't changed much with my new job, but I definitely I like, wake up and I'm like, I'm excited to create something that people enjoy, right? Whereas in the video game industry, if you don't ever ship a video game, and this was kind of the problem with that company, 
you don't get that fulfillment of like someone enjoying your work, right? This was like every day I did something on the website, people would like it or people would respond to it and see, wow. right? And so that's very addictive. The money was like, it wasn't exactly what I was making. I was making, uh, uh, I don't remember exactly. I think it was like, I mean, we had bonuses and stuff, so it's hard to calculate. But I was making like two thirds of that when I switched to Board Game Geek, right? Plus all the expenses of running the company, right? It was just me by myself. So you still had a substantial enough income where you weren't going to be, uh, you know, on food stamps or welfare. Oh no, no, it was never that. No, and in fact, that would never. I, I would never take that risk. Right, right, okay. You, you know, like I had just gotten married, right? Like Michelle and I got married. That, so, yeah, I was asking yeah. that question. Okay, so at 2005, then you decided to go into this full time. And then you had said previously you were still only getting like maybe a thousand people a year or, th you know, this or that, finding yeah. out about it. So uh, after 2005, um, what was the growth like year per year? And was there any one thing, you know, like a meteorite hitting or something that all of a sudden just put you over the edge? Uh, the growth was pretty uh, slow, <laughs> right? Because you get it like the way the internet works now is like you can just rock it through a viral thing and just like get a million users overnight, that kind of thing. That did not happen with BoardGameGeek. It was very slow, slow, steady, maybe 10, I think it was about 20% growth per year, just as a, a user base type, you know, people signing up. Um, now, I, I can't completely nail this down, but tabletop, you know, the Will Wheaton thing? Oh, yes. Cult. There was a significant increase in registrations after Tabletop came out. Like oh, right around in that era. Yeah. That late. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So, thanks, Will Wheaton. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So then if you're doing this all by yourself and you're and you're growing, how and when or did you have to bring other people in when it got too much for you? Yeah. So Board Game Geek is very like I don't know what the right word is, <laughs> but like when we needed something to happen, like we would hire somebody, right? It wasn't like, we're just going to hire a bunch of people and get it going. It was like, well, uh, I can't keep up with advertising. And that was sort of like the first hire was Chad, chatty boy. Uh, and he, and he basically came to me and he's like, I told him like kind of the dilemma of it. Like people need artwork for ads and they want to, you know, and we want to sell this stuff, but I just don't have time because I'm constantly programming stuff. And he's like, oh, I'll just do it on the side. Like, I'll just see. And he did a graphic design thing. And I'm like, oh, that's really awesome. And then he's like, well, yeah, I could probably start. I really like doing this. He was, I like, I like helping create graphics and stuff. And I'm like, well, do you want to just do it on like a contingency? And he, I'm like, you know, pay you a percentage. If you make sale, I'll, I'll give you some percentage of that. And he, and he did it. And he did it for a number of years. So uh, eventually we turned him into a full-time employee where it was like guaranteed, right? right. Instead of based on, plus it was more, it was kind of a crazy good deal for him. Right. He would make more money than anyone <laughs> because he was making a percentage of sales of that. So it was kind of like needed to fix it. Right. right. Uh, so he was like basically the first hire. Right. Okay. So Chad was your first hire. And of yeah. course, because you needed to bring revenue in to keep money going. So yeah. you got this thing going. Now, as you said, it was a problem that you needed to solve. Right. Yeah. You, you couldn't do it. You had to bring him in. What was the next problem and what was the next employee? Uh, it's a toss up because I can't quite remember. It feels like not that long ago, but it was kind of, I mean, it was back in the 2000s, right? So coming up on, we're basically 20 years. Um, so the next problem was code, which is my job. So I brought another coder and, and we brought in a coder who had no experience and no credentials. <laughs> Perfect coder job, right? How but, uh, experience? Like how yeah, so. Experience. He was actually Dan Carp is the second guy. Okay. So um, he was actually a um, oh I forget what it is, but it's something like molecular biology or physics physics or something like like physics like something very. He was working on his PhD and he just I guess he got it done and he started working on the code and helped me out and doing little things here and there and eventually just thing one thing became another and he wanted to start working for us so he did so he was basically the second person. Okay. Um, but it's a tie between him and Matthew Monin, who is our community manager, right? Yeah. So as the forums get more popular, as people start posting more stuff and there's more people to manage, I guess a community management type job is necessary. Um, so he was basically the third. 
but it's tied between Dan and him, but I don't remember. I think Dan was first and Matt Matthew was third. Oh, okay. All right. So also I, I want to talk about now that it's established, you know, you've were in around the, you know, the early, you know, 2005 to 10 or whatever, and all that kind of stuff. And even to where it is today, um, there are some people, even including me who find it sort of difficult to navigate. Um, cause I have friends who like, they can find anything. They're just, they're super dorked out about it and know the ins and outs of everything. I'm just not that type of person. And I just want to know, does it seem like you've ever made it easier? Is, is that on purpose? Why is it still sort of hard to navigate? Good question. But we do have people working on that. So we're constantly fighting with, and this is hard, right? Cause I wrote the website for myself. So for me, it's like two plus two, but I understand not everybody is the same and lots of people diff learn differently. Right. Um, but that was basically it, right? Like if I wanted a way to make a list, a geek list, we just like literally in like two days, wrote the code and had it done with very little thought given to UX. So UX is user experience, which hopefully is self-explanatory, meaning like how do you use a website? How do you make it easy to use? How do you make it useful for everyone? Okay. That is super challenging. That's a very tough job because everybody's different on the web, right? Like something you might think is easy, I might think it's hard and vice versa. Um, but you know, we, we keep working on it. I mean, we, we, we understand that it's a challenge and um, I'm always trying to figure out like why someone can't find something or do what they want to do, right? Like I'm very curious to know, what's the word? This use, the user story, right? As it were, like your persona, why can you not figure out what is the, what you want to do? Right. Like that's constant. We're constantly working on that. Okay. Um, and though even, B, you know, even BGG is a small website, like, or sorry, a small company. BGG is a big website. It's a top 1000 website in the world. Right. So that we bring now we bring in a fair amount of traffic, but we're minuscule in size compared to oh, a yeah. Google, a Facebook, but we get compared to there. Cause we're all on the same medium, right? We're all on the same web, the right, wide right. web. Uh, so it's kind of flattering to be compared to Facebook type websites or Google type websites, but those are billion dollar companies. Um, yeah. Board Game Geek is not a billion dollar company, by the way. <laughs> like not right. yet. Well, you're close <laughs> to it, right? 900 million. <laughs> yeah, I only need like 999 million, 900, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that brings up an interesting point. So you mentioned Google and Facebook and you're in the top 1,000. Congratulations, that's fantastic. But those sites are inherently for the every man. Like I was saying, like, or every person, I'm sorry. I right, every person. Yeah. Every person. Uh, like me. Um, so BGG, in essence, still hasn't quite crossed that threshold or barrier to be for the every person. Or am I wrong? And if you if it hasn't, are you trying to? And what I mean by that is where it's not just a word of mouth. Oh, you're in the games? Go to Board Game Geek. Where somebody walking in the Walmart or Target or picking up Sorry or Parcheesi would have heard about it or know about it that it is the resource for gaming. It's a good question. And that may be beyond my capability. Okay. Like, I don't know if I'm able to take it to that every person level. But I mean, do you want to? I mean, is that... Of course. Is, oh, yeah, yeah. No, I want to. We, we, we want to. We want it to... We don't want anyone turned away, right? Yeah, like, it would be awesome for us as a company. It would be awesome for me personally. Um, it, but here's the problem. It's like chain. I, I figured out a great analogy. Okay. It's like changing the tires on a car that's running to do this kind of stuff. Right. Okay. Yeah. You're kind of like, we we've tried and, and, and believe me, th this is my life for the past probably 10 years trying to figure this out. Um, figuring out how to keep it running and doing what it's doing without uh, and also updating it to the modern world. We've tried. We've basically thought, oh, we're just going to completely overhaul it. We've done that two times, in fact. And it's, and and both times we've kind of come to the realization that's just too big of a job to do all at once. Mm -hmm. And we've kind of been like working on revising, revising, revising. I don't know if you've, uh, I don't know how much of a devotee of Board Game Geek you are, but you probably have seen changes over the years. Oh, like, oh yeah. Uh -huh. um, a lot of people think there's not been anything, but I can <laughs> assure you. <laughs> that there has uh, been. <laughs> based on my hours of working on this and time spent, uh -huh. uh, it's been happening. So, um, but yeah, I totally understand the problem. I get it. Um, but, and we're uh, tackling it, but I don't know if it will ever be 
will it ever be that person, every person's website? No, but again, finding, yeah. Right. And again, Aldi, it's, it's not like you're required or have to do that. Right. It's not like, Oh yeah. But I, I just want to know if it's sort of, and, and I guess you said it is, you know, you wake up every day trying to figure that out because it is such, you know, even though board game geek is huge, it's massive. The gaming industry is huge. It's still a niche thing. It's, right? It's tiny. Yeah. Everybody it thinks it's huge, but it is tiny in comparison it, to most it, entertainment it, hobbies. It, yeah, for sure. Right. But again, it's one of those kind of things, you know, since I own a board game cafe and I've just got, you know, the normal non non gamers like us walking in the door, just average people, and they have never heard board game geek, know nothing about it. They'll walk in and think I own every game in the world. You know what I mean? They just don't realize that. So I just keep wondering how can we get more people into our passion, you know, into the, what we do. And I'm glad to see that it is something that's constantly on your mind and you're trying to do. And I was just oh, wondering yeah. what kind of things you may be doing to get there. Yeah. Yeah, well, we've 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 hired a, a very excellent designer. He's like one of the best guys I've ever worked with, um, okay. and he knows stuff. Like, I think it's generational a little bit. Like, if you've been on the web for like what now? I I mean, I was on there since day one, which would be 1993 or 92 when it first started. You just get used to stuff, right? Like, you get used to sort sort of how things work, and that's a problem, right? Because a lot of people, let's call them um, new generation, don't have all that experience of the old days, right? They want everything to work perfectly and without uh, discomfort, <laughs> right? Of like, ah, oh, I got to figure out how to get this work, you know, to get this right. thing loaded or I want to download this movie. By the way, we're living in the future, like comparatively, right? Like I, oh yeah, growing up in the 90s and or, uh, 80s and 90s and having like very little of anything of like what we have now, it's quite amazing. So keeping that in perspective, that's probably where I need to get younger people or a younger mind generationally to fix what may be wrong with board game geek. And that's what we're doing. Um, so we've got him working on it and he's fantastic. And he has a, a very good idea of what it should be. Right. Okay. And so the, 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 a challenge is to keep the old users happy. Right. Because we, I think we just, we're, we're coming close on 3 million users. Wow. without and and um keeping them happy so they don't yep. go but getting new people in the new blood right so big right. challenge yeah so now that you say you've hired uh this excellent designer uh um, kyle is his name okay how big is the company now how many employees or full -time? Um, i don't know what you would consider it but do you have so it's a combination of uh full-time employees and contractors okay um I think the last count was about 20, let's say contributors. Some are paid, some are not, right? Mm -hmm. But I will say the Board Game Geek crew, the company is 20, 20 people. Okay. And out of that, how many are like sort of full time? Like if you, yeah. like I know everybody works remotely, but if you had an office, how many right. people would be coming nine to five to that office? You know what I mean? Like, uh, uh, Let me count. <laughs> I always have, I always have trouble because it's like, there's so many now it's like hard to keep it all in my head. Right. 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 Uh, when, let me just do a quick count. I would say seven. Okay. And what are their jobs? If you don't mind telling us like, what is each? Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's, it's a lot of what I already covered. Um, right. It's Daniel mm -hmm. programmer, Matthew community manager, Chad advertising manager, Eric news. And what, what do you call that? News and, uh, information manager, um, Beth Hiley, who is now the product manager. So she's creating lots of new products and all the stuff you see in the store, like the geek up bits. Um, what am I missing? Lincoln, who is the director of media, right? So all the videos we create and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm probably leaving somebody out, which I'm going to be mass mad at myself. <laughs> uh, what am I up to six? Uh, oh, well, Jeff, An so Jeff Anderson is technically not employed, but he might as well be because he runs all of the conventions, right? Right. right. It's all through his company. He runs a company that has media, right? Um, so I'll say Jeff also, you know what? We might be more, we might be like 10 okay. <laughs> because we have a store too, like the board game geek store. Um, we have uh, three full-time employees in there. So yeah, so the company is growing. It's getting quite big. You're expanding into more things. And speaking of that, one of your recent acquisitions is tabletop events, uh, which right. you have brought into the BGG fold. So tell us a little bit about that, how that came, and then maybe what are the plans for the future with that? 
Right. So if you're familiar with the tabletop uh, events website, it's a, how to describe it? Basically an event management system for board gaming, uh, board gaming and role-playing game uh, conventions, right? So if you want to create a convention and don't want to deal with all the management of it, like how do I create tickets? How do I get people to sign up? How do I create events? How do I do merch? How do I, how many other things there are? Uh, that will do it for you. So they, when we hit the pandemic, the beginnings, uh, all conventions are pretty much canceled, right? So you could see what that would do to tabletop events. It would basically reduce them to almost zero, like income, right? Like no events were happening uh, physically. Uh, and they put out a call to people saying, hey, we need help. We're probably going to shut down. Uh, and I think they ran a convention on their own virtually to help raise funds to make it through the end of the year. Um, but I called them um, and, and basically said, hey, I, uh, I can, you know, what, what, do you look, what are you thinking of? Do you want to sell the company? What do you, you know, we just had a conversation. And as I got into more talking with them, I was very impressed with what they've written, what this, this code base that has been created to run this uh, entire tabletop events uh, website. Um, and I was like trying to figure out, well, should we just acquire the company? And basically that's what happened. So we've acquired the company. Um, a couple of the people are still, uh, that came along with them, um, but the founders are all ex all exited. But uh, that was a interesting bad story, good story kind of thing, because I think the system is fantastic. And it's like, it's it would be a shame to have that shut down and like, I mean, it. There's several big conventions. In fact, Board Game Geek is going to start running on it now. Like if had if tabletop events was around when we started BGGCon, like we would have run it on that system, that platform, because it's just so good. Right. And and yeah, because they have their own library system, I know, but you being a coder have your own library system. So I'm interesting to hear uh, that you had it previously with BGG. I'm interesting to hear how, how since this is your background and you've acquired this already existing platform, and you you were impressed with it, and that's you know obviously you got your stamp of approval because you know what you're talking about. But what is it that you are now going to bring to it that you think is going to bring it up to that next level to incorporate all of BGG into it? That's a good question. Um, I think we want to bring it together so that the sharing of data is more there, right? Like. I guess as a, you know, and, and in fact, we probably need to talk to the event coordinators. 2020 has been a whirlwind, by the way, just, just FYI. I mean, I want to keep all this stuff going, but it's hard. Of course, yes. Um, personally and professionally. But uh, yeah, we want to bring in, like, let's say you keep track of your collection, right? You can be friends with the people on there and you can share, like, some conventions run where they, like, bring games. There's This has always been a desire of mine. Um, we call it the um, dance card, the gaming dance card, right? Like, what games do you want to play? What games do I want to play? Let's put our collections together. Who needs to bring what to make this happen, right? These are for the smaller conventions that don't have like giant libraries, game libraries. Um, so let's say you want to play Kalos and I want to play Tigers and Euphrates. Well, I'll bring Tigers and Euphrates, you bring Kalos, and then we're covered, right? Like, so we could both be happy. Um, that type of system I want badly. Like, people Good. do it That's manually good. all the time, right? Yeah. And um, that would be awesome. So I call it the gaming dance card. Okay. Um, that's just one idea, but right. I think there could be more. Yeah. I'm sure there, I'm sure there's plenty more, but I'm, I'm the reason I'm really interested is because I do run dice tower West, you know, along with Dave uh, and Tom, and I'm just, I, I, I sort of want you to sell me on it. Cause I want you to promote it of course, but I also want other convention organizers to know or understand why this may be the right option for them because of what you may bringing into that. So I, I just want to kind of put it to you right there, Aldi. I'm a convention manager. Why yeah. should I, why should I get tabletop.events uh, backed by BGG or part of BGG for my event? Right. So uh, I think one of the best things it does is uh, the ticketing and event creation system. So I don't know. I, I have not been unfortunately to Dice Tower West yet, or I don't, but I, <laughs> I want to make it. I <laughs> I know that not for lack of invite, believe me, I know. Right. <laughs> um, but if you want to run scheduled events or even user based scheduled events, right? Like, so let's say, Tim, you want to run a tournament of uh, Teach You. Let's say you want 32 teams. You can create that event on tabletop events and people can sign up. 
that's that's a huge thing for us. Like the fact that you can create an event, have you have the attendees of the event sign up, um, and base and basically run it. It almost runs itself, right? Okay. Uh, because it, it will send messages out to everybody. People can drop out or come back or, you know, like there's lots of, lots of management that it does that. I don't know if you've done that by hand, that's a nightmare, right? right. We've done it by hand. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we've run it like very, very simply before and board game geek com is all like run by hand, right? A lot of that type stuff. Um, so let's say you want to run a puzzle hunt and you have 250 slots. You can have that all set up. So the event management system alone is very, very key. Okay. Um, there is a complete accounting system in there. You can track all of your, uh, income and expenses. You can have your tickets there. You can have different levels of tickets. You have things called perks, right? Let's say you have a, let's say you have a, um, a publisher being like, I can give you 50 copies of this game. Well, the first 50 that people that sign up could have access to that, right? Like through the perk system and you can have unlimited numbers of perks and ticket levels, hugely customizable. Um, there's a complete, um, what do you call it? Wiki system where you can create how to's for all of your conventions. Like if you do something differently, like at BGGCon, we do the virtual flea market and we have the the ma the, the um, math trade, right? We can create detailed uh, uh, instructions on how to participate. Like you may have heard about this thing, but how do you participate? Well, you can create all that information, right? So like each sort of convention runs on its own um, like isolated page. Right. And then you can also copy that. So from year to year to year, you can copy from your old one to your new one. Right. So you can inherit all of the cool stuff you did from the previous event and then right. start fresh. Okay. So now I know the answer is going to be yes, because you do want this to be the go to resource, the platform that all board game conventions use. And um, that is your goal. And do you think that? By 2021, it will be achievable that there really is no question for me to consider as a, an event, uh, convention event organizer to use your system um, that you will be giving me sort of every single resource, every kind of thing you need with the backing of the BGG. Do you think you'll be able to accomplish that? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I'd, I'd be surprised if it didn't already, right? Oh, like yeah. without at extras. Now, uh, there is a check-in, check-out system, the library system, like you talked about. I don't know if you've done, dealt with that. Yep. You may use an off-the-shelf thing or like something different. Um, I believe it already does import your user library. So if you yep. type in your username, it can import what your game library would be. So there's kind of a lot already there. But um, if it didn't do something, I'd love to hear it. Like we should talk, like me, you, and Jeff Anderson. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah, so to prioritize, because that's best feedback, right? The users of the website telling you exactly what they want. Like, right. So, awesome. so an interesting thing with this, because um, it sort of brings me up to my next question, is about, you know, since BGG is sort of like an open platform, uh, right? And people can use your information, use your stuff, the tabletop. So uh, tabletop, let's use as like part B of the question. But part A, um, how do you allow the use of your stuff for people to use everything? Do you have restrictions, what they can make of it, you know, use your resources, you know, monetize from it, all that kind of stuff. What are the policies and stuff about people using the board game geek resources and database for themselves? Yeah. So this is probably something that we have to come back to, but uh, we do have a, uh, what they call an API. Um, uh, application programming interface. I don't know if that makes means any sense to you, but basically it's a uh, information transfer. Okay. Like you can get the information through this thing called an API, which we allow anyone to use for free, no cost. However, we do, we do, we do have a restriction of commercial use, right? So you're not allowed to use it for commercial use. But I understand that that's limiting. <laughs> so we do have to kind of, I think we have to adapt to that in the more modern era. Like there are so many people I've seen use it for commercial use without asking or permission. And we don't, I mean, obviously there's legal things that are implicated here, but we would like to tighten that up and make it um, make it easy to use for everybody, right? Like why why should we restrict you from making making money off of it? Uh, I don't I don't see a problem with that. Okay, no. we do currently have a non-commercial use version of it, right? It's basically like, well, you could take all that data and make a copy of Board Game Geek. Why would, a, why would I want that to happen? You know, that's not what I want happening. Yeah. 
Right. No, and it's good that you say that. And of course, you know, people do have to be diligent and cognizant that it is your property, but to use it. And I'm glad that you are willing to let people uh, make money off it, monetize it, use the resources and all that. And that kind of brings me to sort of a, a pretty deep question. Um, and I just want you to kind of be honest about it. And you did say it in your mission statement, how Board Game Geek, um, you do want to be the the sort of a premier best resource, whatever board games, but you're sort of there, right? And what I want to try to get to Aldi is, you know how there's all these sometimes things come up with say like Amazon has a monopoly. They've gotten too big to fail, all this kind of stuff. Now, I know you have to be really proud of the fact and you should be and congratulations for making Board Game Geek what it is. But at the same time, where is that sort of terrifying or, and, and you know what I mean when I get this, it's just a matter of discussion, like, and not, I mean, I can't think of a lack of a better term, but unethical point where it is the only one and you have monopolized the board game community. Do, do you know what I, what I mean? So I just, oh, I, yeah, for sure. I'm just wondering, what are your thoughts about that kind of thing? Um, yeah, good question. I mean, basically to say that I don't believe in monopolies based, you know, I, I don't. Like, you know, Amazon has a lot of power, all that stuff. I agree. Google has a lot of power. Um, does Board Game Geek have that same power? I don't know. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, I definitely feel there are competitors to Board Game Geek. By the way, Facebook being probably our number one competitor. Um, so I don't know if we'd ever get to that point where we are the monopoly of board gaming information or of the board gaming community, because I see other places. Um, if it was, I don't know. Like, how would I deal with that? Uh, I mean, for one thing, we give away the API, right? I mean, like, right. other people can use that. Like, I don't think, pretty sure Facebook doesn't let you have access to all people's stuff for free. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Right, right, I don't know. That's a good question. Like, I, like, uh, do you mean like, so if someone wanted to say, well, I want my own board gaming community, how can I make that happen, right? Or and I can't oh. because board gaming, not, yeah, I mean... And again, Aldi, it's, this is just one of those kind of discussion things because I'm, oh, yeah. I'm not saying it's anything bad. You're not doing anything bad. But it is sort of like you you have sort of like you, you've won the race in essence and there's sort of nobody else in the race. And, and again, there are others. I'm not putting anybody down. But oh, yeah. you know you are like way up there and it would be really hard to catch up. But it has happened. I mean, look, MySpace right. was the king of the mountain. And now Facebook took them over. They disappeared. So the potential is there. But – I don't see it. I don't see anybody kind of even relatively close as far as numbers, viewers being in the top 1,000 for board games. So it, it's a good place to be. Like I said, I want to congratulate you because that's fantastic. You've done a great job, but it is sort of coming to yeah. that point too. I get it. I get it. Um, I'm not sure I, I have a great answer. I mean, like, are my goals finished? Uh, I don't think so, because oh. basically you said – Board Game Geek's not for every person, right? And that's there's still so many things to do. Correct. Like I don't feel like it's over. Um, there's still a sense of competition, I guess, with the Facebooks of the world and the Reddits of the world, the big giant monopolies of those types of information. Like I feel like I'm a little guy I'm fighting, you know, those those big ones, right? Like that's the way I sense Board Game Geek to be. No, it's sort of always been indie, right? Like no one owns the company except me. Right, you know, right, right. basically, it's it's not a corporate this a corporate run thing to squeeze every dollar out of the board game industry. No, 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 absolutely, you know, and, yeah. And but I understand. Right. And I mean, I hope I'm a good steward for what we've been given oh, right, no, from the community. You, you know? are absolutely. And again, these are just th this is. There's no right answer to this. It's yeah. just discussion kind of things. You know what I mean? Sure. I like stuff like that. Let's just talk about it because it's interesting. Yeah. But along those same lines, Aldi. Um, Board Game Geek itself does, in essence, wield a big hammer. I mean, they do have very big inf influence on the board gaming community. However, this is kind of where I would say you're sort of off the hook in a way. And you know what I mean in a sense. But it's not, it's not you saying it, right? It's the contributors saying it where the community gets together to kind of sway the influence industries right? yeah right but it still does right that you're you, yeah. you are the conduit for that right Right, it's the conduit to con to i guess it's probably the biggest indicator of like 
what people are into in the hobby world, right? Obviously this is, this has no, nothing to do with any mainstream type games or that kind of, you know, those kind of games. So the hobby world, board game geek, the trends are very influential, like the top hundred or a thousand or 2000, you know, um, I'm always concerned about that, but I, and I try to keep my hands off it as much as I can. Cause I don't want to like, I'm a very, um, what's the word egalitarian person. Like the, the origins of board game geek come from a place to break down gatekeeping, right? Like I didn't want to be stuck in a private mailing list for the rest of my life to talk about board games. So I want data to be free. I want all the information to be free. I want that stuff to just exist. But I understand that when you bring all the users into it, that changes things because that directs the way the board game world looks. Right. Right. So like, like Gloomhaven, for instance, which shot up the ranks and won number one. And, you know, before that it was Twilight Struggle, right? Remember that? Yeah, absolutely. Like that is newsworthy. Like, I mean, it's newsworthy to us, but you know, like I understand that. And I'm, and it's a little scary because like if it's manipulated in a way that I can't understand, like there are very sophisticated people out there who, if they want to do something in the electronic world, they can usually do it. Right. right. I mean, without getting political things have happened in the world. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would think board game geek would be an easy target to, <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, I don't want, I want monopoly to be the number one game of all time. You know, that obviously that's kind of a ridiculous thing, but there could be subtle things out there at work that who knows. And I understand the danger of it. So yeah, and it's I always, true. yeah, I always say, take the, take everything with a grain of salt, right? Right. right like right. the board gaming world does not, you don't need to be told what to play. In fact, this, this is what's awesome. And I had this comment with uh, Lance last week. Okay. Any game almost now, within reason, not everything, but a lot, has someone playing a game, a playthrough video, or doing a rules video, or doing a review, or doing a thing like on video. Like, how crazy is that? If you were back in the 90s and the early 2000s, there was nothing. That's it was right. a barren landscape for like maybe 10 games a year that got interest, that got noticed. Right. So I feel like we're living in this like, Oh, it's an embarrassment of riches for board game content, right? And everybody's doing it for free. That's right. It's crazy. It is. It is. It's, it's crazy and it's fantastic. And again, you know, I, I like to point this out all the time because my mother spent her entire life uh, in diversity, working at universities. You know, uh, she was vice chancellor in, you know, diversity departments and all those kind of things. But yes, it it, it makes for more of a diversity because like you said, when there's more reviewers, more. Oh, yeah. And I think all kind and of I think we you and I are on the same page, like we're only scratching the surface of diversity in the board game world, right? Yes. It's very like white male driven like that. And, and, and then in another thing, I personally want to bring up more voices, right? BGG right. is that place. I think that we can highlight more voices and I'm, and we're working like, in fact, like our new homepage is going to basically blow your mind. Oh, nice. As far as highlighting new players, right? For sure. Really looking forward to that because again, and that's probably, um, I would like to maybe have a, a panel discussion or something about that later. Yeah. But sort of on the same topic, Aldi, and you know that I'm talking about uh, the community and the board game and it's user contributed. Um, here is something, again, I didn't know about, uh, but a friend of mine, one of my dork uh, BGG friends, who's just like a, like just blows my mind with what he <laughs> knows and can manipulate his way around it. So we're a community, or not we, Board Game Geek, but you know, we, when we, I'm saying yeah. a part of the board game community. Yeah, yeah. It's a board game community and all this kind of stuff, sort of games. But he told me there was a big thing that I never, again, I never heard about called, I guess, RSP, religion, sex, politics, or some kind of forum or thing. Like there was a thing. Now, I, I want to know your thoughts because one of the things, I don't know if you've noticed that I'm trying to do with the interviews is I don't want to be, hey, what's your favorite game? What's your best yeah. mechanic? Because everybody does it. I want to talk about you and I want to talk about other things other than games. So we are human beings living in a world where things affect us and obviously he had told me that there was a big controversy because there was this was very popular to people because again you want to talk about maybe stuff off the table religion sex policy different things and there was this whole thing it got taken down moderate i don't know but can you just talk about your stance with board game geek being a gaming first site that's what it is however when members of your community want to discuss and talk about other things, your thoughts about including that or being inclusive, being diverse with topics such as that within the board game geek community. 
Yeah, it's a tough question. Um, <laughs> because Board Game Geek was created as a informational database place to talk about games, right? But obviously in the modern world, we have to discuss these things. So we sort of made this religion, sex, politics. Be because if you're coming to Board Game Geek as just a player, right? And you come into, I don't know, let's say some controversial game that has slavery in it, which many of the board games do, right? The historical type stuff, lots of slavery, lots of, lots of uh, subject matter that's... Um, uh, hard, you know, to, to discuss every single game should not be filled with that. Right. Like we, we, we want to create a friendly platform that is open to anyone, right. That respects people's discussion. If you've got a guy coming in there and hammering, hammering, hammering on everything, it, it, it's just, it's just, it, it chases people away. It just does. So we created this specific section on board game we called RSP, like you said, religion, sex, politics, where, Anybody could discuss anything about that stuff. Now, we've swung the pendulum back the other way. We've taken that down out of the forum system and moved it into a guild. So, and, and who knows if this is the right answer. Like, we're just trying to exist and make people happy, I guess. But that's, that's my first, first mistake is trying to make people happy. But allow that discussion to exist, but in a place that's not so in your face, right? That's, that's basically what has happened there. I don't know what... Um, particular thing we're talking about but because right, so I, I get yeah. it because i guess uh it was sort of be unmoderated then it become moderate oh yeah yeah unmoderated anything goes and then it just got it just got a wicked play i never believe me i try not to <laughs> go down these holes that just make me angry right like i'm trying i i understand it exists it's there and we let it go like it was just whatever you want to talk about you can do it here however that's that was the wrong okay uh, answer Right. So then how is or how tough is it for you as Aldi, as a person with your views, with your thoughts, whatever they are in the world, but yet you know you have this platform, however you can dictate what either does go up, what doesn't go up, all this kind of stuff. How do you balance that with what you said is you don't want something to be in your face, you want the gaming, but this is what people may want who knows what the correct answer is. And I'm, you, maybe you can't give me an exact answer, but how do you balance that with Aldi and board game geek? Board game geek. Confluence, yes. I usually defer to other people <laughs> because I'm very egalitarian. Like my life is, you know, I want everyone to have their voice and be able to say whatever they want. Now right. there's places for that, right? Like I don't want to stifle anybody's free speech or any of that kind of stuff, but with limits, right? The, uh, so it's a hard juggle, right? Like I, if it was left to me, I would have left BGG be unmoderated forever, but <laughs> that creates yeah, terrible I'm sure. community. Right. I had to acquiesce to remember the community manager was somebody I hired, right? Cause I know I can't do that job myself. I have a terrible weakness and, um, for letting people just do what they want, right? Like, I don't want to make you unhappy. Do what you want. But that hurts other people, right? That can hurt other people. I have to push that feeling off myself and be like, how does this affect that community overall and the health of it? And like the feeling of safety that you can come to Board Game Geek and talk about stuff without fear of, uh, you know, being told, well, your opinion sucks. <laughs> like that, that I don't want, right? Like that, that anti like you're stupid, you, you know, um, there's a whole list of things like, um, yes. that we've, yeah. we've, we've, every year we revise those rules for how to post on BGG, right? It's Cause the world grows and board game geek grows and different types of people come in who maybe are not used to that kind of stuff. Right. Like, right. No, absolutely. You know, you know, a lot, a lot of the Twitters and Facebooks of the world, let you post whatever you want. Almost. Oh yeah. Right. I can post almost whatever I want on Facebook. I can be as mean spirited as I want to be Jeez. and I will not be, I will not be moderated. Right. 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 So unless I post truly disgusting stuff, right. Mm -hmm. There are limitations there too, but board game geek is, was trying to strive for that. And I was like, well, let people talk whatever they want. If they're, if they're talking about the games they talk about the games, but mm -hmm. then it starts getting into that personal at hominem attacks. Yep. Yep. No, I get it. I feel I, like I'm against that by the way. Of course, of course. And everybody should be. I mean, uh, because and, and I get the whole thing, you know, like there are those people, hey, board gaming is my safe space. I just want to talk about board gaming. They don't want to get religion, sex, politics or whatever kind of stuff in that. I mean, I, I get all that. And that's why it's sort of like, you know, I'm an, I'm an old school guy. If you don't want to listen to the radio, uh, that song, change the station. If you don't want to watch yeah. a TV show, change the station. And the same thing here with Board Game Geek. I think it's good that 
yes, at least you have a place for people who do want to do that because it's like, hey, you know what? I love Agricola, but I also want to talk about politics. Let's go with this forum because, you know, and there are people and it's good that those kind of people who have those two things want to talk about those can find those. But if you're not, you just don't have to go there. It's that simple, right? I wish you, I wish as most people were as easygoing as you, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the way I feel too. Like if it bugs you, don't read it. Like exactly. if you want, here's the thing. It exists on Board Game Geek still in yep. a much different form than it used to. Okay. Uh, and you have to really search for it. And we're not going to make it easy because if you are just trying, we don't want it to be the first something for first thing someone sees, right? I mean, it's just, that's bad. Like, oh, what's this board game website? Oh, they're talking about, I don't I don't want to come up with any, any, any examples, but like, I'm out of here. Like, why would I bother with this, right? Like, no, we want to talk about board games. <laughs> yes, no, absolutely, absolutely. Well, Aldi, um, I just want to say thank you so much for uh, joining me here on Meepable Meets. Um, I learned a lot. Right, yeah, absolutely. I learned a lot. And, uh, <laughs> and I really just want to thank you and the Board Game Geek community because, um, I mean, I want to go into my whole story, how I found it and all that kind of stuff. But gaming to me is, is uh, you know how, like, because uh, I'm a, a fan of Close Encounters, and they th that whole theme was, like, you know, music is the uh, universal yeah, language. language. But, you know, as I've gotten older, I'm sure it still may be, but I think gaming is too, right? If you're on a beach, you can draw a tic-tac-toe, and I think anybody from any culture part of the world would play with you. They would know what's going yeah. on. It's, so a, it's a human thing. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it's a... Yeah, especially if you the, just want to toss the, the, a ball. To play, yeah. Correct. If you want to get off the table, tossing a ball, kicking a ball, throwing, a, you know, rock, sports, gaming is universal. Absolutely. And Board Game Geek has become that place, and you've done a wonderful job, and thank you for continuing to do thank that. You. And at the same time, I know you ask for things, and please, people, every year they have a – go ahead and, and uh, talk about that real quick. What is um the uh, the, the pledge that you, you do every year? Um, oh, yeah. So we do an annual uh, support drive. Yes. Uh, this is yeah. Yeah. So this is completely um, at your will. Like you don't, yeah. we don't require this. We don't charge anything for using board gaming. It's always free. It will always be under my reign. Um, <laughs> so uh, we do an annual support drive. If you want to contribute, you can go to boardgamegeek.com slash support. It's right. Really simple. And the, um, yeah. And the reason we, I didn't want to mention that is because it's free. And that's the yeah. big thing I want to thank you for is allowing a lot of people who may not have the resources, may not do whatever, to be able to go there. And you have full access just as much as somebody who does contribute, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the really good thing about it because, you know, there are sites that have different levels, right? You contribute, yeah. this door opens. But no, the people who do contribute, like I do, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. I'm sorry. I either miss the date, forget about it, or do whatever. <laughs> Again, I'm not a dork and I just may missed it, you know, a super BGG uh, thing. But thank you for that because it does allow me to just tell people, hey, go to Board Game Geek, look at this database, and they could do it and they can enjoy everything about it for 100% free. Uh, 100%. So that, nothing. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Well, that, that goes back to my old beginnings, right? Like, why is this information hidden? Why should it be hidden for only certain it's, types of people? It should be available. Me, I want the whole world to enjoy what we've already found and enjoy. That's right. Uh, I think a lot of people are blown away when they first figure out like what can lie in these boxes, right? That's like right. Where, uh, just the, the, the crazy rabbit hole. I call it the rabbit hole. That's like, right. You, know, you, got, you got your wingspan and your Catan and your ticket to ride, but like what, what else is down there? That is absolutely. a lot. Yes, it is. Well, thanks again, Aldi. I really appreciate it. And don't go away. I'll be right back with you. Thanks, Tim. Well, there you go, folks, and thank you for joining us again for another edition of Meepleville Meets. Please make sure you go check out BoardGameGeek.com. It is the largest, best, number one resource for everything board games you ever, ever may want to know about. And also, while you're at it, if you enjoy the content here on uh, Meepleville channel, please go ahead and hit the subscribe button and ring the bell for notifications. And that way you can get more content and make sure to check out our other things on the channel. Well, thanks again, and we'll talk to you soon.